So, uh, good morning, dear friends. Um, we are now from Regional Cancer Center Trivandrum. We are going to have a lecture on extended orbital acceleration for sinonasal malignancy with orbital apex extension using the anterior and middle force exposure. In fact, uh, I met Professor Takashi Sugavara, who is going to give this lecture about five to six months back at a conference in Russia and Tumen. And I was really impressed by this lecture uh, because about four to five years back, myself and Dr. Sisha, who is a head and neck surgeon from this center, we are doing a case of sinonasal cancer, squamous cell carcinoma with cripiform plate involvement. And this patient came to us that he has gone in all the centers and we offered them only chemo, palliative chemo, but he wanted to take the chemo out. And nobody was willing to do that. And then myself, Dr. Sisha, and our neurosurgeon, Dr. Ajit, we removed the entire tumor using the craniofacial resection. And that patient is doing fine even now, five years down the line, without any. And at that time, when we did the surgery, we didn't have much evidence to do the surgery. And uh, since after uh, and five years down the line, when I heard the lecture from Professor Takashi at Japan, I was really impressed by his lecture. And I thought I should, should, he should share this view to uh, on course students here in the Cancer Center. And that's why I invited him to give this lecture. So Professor Pekash is a very eminent neurosurgeon from Japan. Uh, he heads the uh, Canada Neurosurgical Center. And with this formal introduction, I, I invite Professor Pekashi to start his lecture. And uh, here with me, we have Dr. Devin Varghese, who is a senior uh, associate pro uh, in a professor of Ponto surgery. A regional Cancer Center. And in the, in the panel, we have Professor Nara, Naran Janigram, who is a well known figure across the globe. And he, uh, Takashi is going to give the lecture. So let's start with this. Over to Professor Takashi. So, can, should I share now? Yeah, I can hear you, but I think, I think you're getting a minimum screen, screen now. Yeah. Yes, you're on now, Takashi. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Can you see the slide? Yes, you can see the slide. Okay. okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity, uh, like uh, lecture about uh, my uh, topic. And uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, surgical technique. Uh, uh, for the extended orbital excentration for sinonasal malignancy with orbital apex ex uh, extension, and especially for the uh, uh, maximum exposure of the anterior and the middle fossa, and also the show the long term outcome. And uh, sinonasal malignancies generally have a poor prognosis, and the surgical extirpation still re remains the mainstay for treatment. And in case of sinonasal malignancy with orbital apex extension, gross total tumor resection requires uh, or orbital excentration uh, and the bony skull base resection around the orbital apex to provide uh, sufficient margins. Uh, in this presentation, we describe our surgical strategy and technique about this uh, operation. And between uh, 2004 and 2012, uh, we have 15 patients of uh, sinonasal malignancy with orbital extension. And uh, our, as for our surgical indication, uh, uh, no metastasis to other organs and the invasion of the uh, intraorbital tissue around the orbital apex and uh, also absence of invasion into the cavernous sinus or dura mater. This cancer in, uh, invasion stage uh, corresponds to the uh, T4B stage. And uh, in this uh, term, we have uh, we have a skull base surgery team and composing with uh, of the neurosurgery and the neck surgery and the plastic surgery and uh, this kind of uh, operation. I mean, the sinonasal malignancy is uh, 65 cases and the these 65 cases, 15 cases for such a uh, kind of surgery we have. And from here, I'm gonna uh, show the surgical procedure. The first step is a uh, procedure in nasal cavity uh, with uh, endoscope. In inspection. Uh, 
to determine uh, like a sufficient margin like this. And uh, these are the two more. And uh, here is the most important part, uh, deepest part in the sphenoid side. The next step is uh, we did the uh, uh, coronal scaling incision and the bifrontal uh, craniotomy was done and uh, temporal craniotomy uh, on the affected side. And the orbital bar was removed like uh, with the bone saw like this. And the next step is anterior fossa exposure. Here is the uh, crystal and the Kaza Dura and the Falx. And then uh, bifrontal, bilateral olfactory nerve, and uh, dura was peeled all the way to the jugulus phenoidale, like this, and the uh, dura matter was reconstructed. And this is the maximum exposure of the uh, anterior fossa. And the next step is the middle fossa exposure. Here you, you can see the. Uh, uh, oops. What's up? What's up? A super orbital fissure here and uh, B2. Can you see this is a B2 and around the uh, problem rotating? And then turn it back. And unroof the super orbital fissure here. And then uh, here you can see the uh, uh, second nerve and the uh, Turban here, they cut the meaning of the turban and the uh, uh, temporal dura purpurea were peeled from the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And here you can see the uh, anterior pyramid process. Here is a B3, and then uh, remove the anterior pyramid process. Yeah. And then here is a from a rotten ovale here. And here is the so called uh, lateral loop and the drill of the lateral loop bone and cut the V2. And this is uh, one of the most important part. This, this are the mucosa, spinal sinus mucosa. And then, uh, uh, we can uh, get into the deepest part of the spinal sinus, <coughs> this uh, corridor. And uh, the next to it, I'm making the resection line. Uh, we use the endoscope from the nasal cavity to uh, guide the resection mixer to get to make the resection line with a sufficient margin. Here you can see the light light from the nasal cavity. We can try to make the sufficient margin like this line. And then the next step is uh, uh, cut the peripabular conjunctiva and the uh, facial skin was peeled from the maxillary bone, maxillary bone like this. And then the uh, maxillary bone was cut with the drill. And then the tumor was uh, enveloped without any exposure of the tumor. The last step is the reconstruction of the defect after tumor resection and um, with the uh, anterolateral side free prop like this. And I also made the uh, ocular prosthesis bed here. And this is the one piece, uh, this is a pre operation picture, and uh, this is a photo uh, operating uh, with uh, ocular prosthesis. This is, I think, this is uh, uh, good uh, enough for this uh, surgery. And uh, this is a shema of the middle of the fossa uh, from my uh, uh, journal.
from my uh, articles. And, uh, this is it's a maximum exposure and cut the uh, optic nerve and uh, uh, third force and V1 uh, and a sixth nerve with Duran and that's it. Uh, B2. And uh, move to the uh, with the cavernous sinus backward and the, uh, expose this uh, place. And uh, as I told you, uh, this is uh, one of the most important parts, so called uh, lateral root, uh, as a uh, corridor to the deepest part of the spinal sinus. And uh, if the uh, tumor uh, invasion. Uh, Invaded uh, with that uh, sphenoid sinus, uh, the resection line was uh, like this, uh, just in front of the promen uh, ovale. Um, but if tumor invaded to the sphenoid sinus, uh, promen ovale was resected uh, like uh, in place. And from here, I'm going to show the clinical analysis. Uh, we have 15 cases, uh, and the uh, primary lesion is uh, uh, ethmoid sinus in six cases, and the maxillary sinus in five cases. And as for histology, skull cell culture in nine cases, and 60% the most. And uh, we have uh, five uh, complications of the uh, infection. All, all five uh, cases are in infection. And then, uh, uh, four or five patients can cure, can be cured with just the irrigation, but uh, unfortunately, one case needs the uh, removal of the uh, bone. And uh, no patient suffered neurologically or any other complication attributable to surgical procedure, and uh, uh, no perioperative mortality. And we have uh, five dead cases, and uh, Three or five uh, cases had uh, recurrence, and uh, the recurrence occurred within five months. And two cases has no uh, recurrence. One died by the pneumonia, and one died by uh, AML. And here is a couple of my curve. Five year recurrence rate survival is more 80%. And a five year overall survival was 66%, but the five year disease specific survival was 80%. And five year overall survival for patients with synthesized malignancy uh, who under, undergo anterior cranial facial restriction has been reported to range between 40 to 55. And the five year uh, recurrence rate survival has been reported uh, that. And the uh, perioperative test rate has been reported as 3 to 4, 5 percent. And, uh, the poor prognosis associated with the malignant tumors of the uh, paranasal sinus is mainly a uh, consequence of the local, rec local recurrence in the skull base. And some studies have suggested that orbital apex involvement positively correlates with higher recurrence rates and a shorter survival. And uh, those are also reported that the involvement of the lateral of the spinal sinus uh, was one of the factors affecting uh, survival. Uh, so we believe that the humble resection with margins, uh, especially at the skull base around the orbital apex, is necessary to avoid local recurrence and uh, contributed to our high estimated overall survival and the country survival rates. And it is also important to make a sufficient resection margin at the uh, deepest part in the spinal sinus, as I told, and to prevent recurrence. Yeah. The conclusion uh, we described the technique for extended orbital exenteration with the apex skull base resection. Uh, this technique uh, provides a high rate of total resection with sufficient margins for synonasal malignancy with orbital apex extension. The estimated five year overall survival and the recurrent uh, survival rates were high, and the uh, uh, perioperative complication rate was excessively low, uh, demonstrating the si safety and the efficacy of this technique. Thank you.
it was a tech it was a very interesting lecture we loved it and i think there are a couple of doubts from the audience here are you ready are you ready to take the doubts sorry it is a very interesting lecture and we really enjoyed it and we have some doubts regarding your lecture um uh dr bibin work is the associate professor of onco surgery here wants to share some experience and doubts with you uh, doubts it i congratulate the professor for the presentation it's a, it's an excellent uh, case where combination of different uh, know how and technologies uh, come in to optimize the outcome of oncological resection <clears throat> So we do have our own uh, set of cases, the series that is building up, wherein we provide, I mean, where these kind of combination of uh, skills have enhanced our results. And in this case, in most of the cases, like the uh, extensive resection which you have shown here, the bottom line is the reconstruction. <clears throat> When you have a cranial cavity exposed uh, so much, you need to have a proper reconstruction. And that is the bottom line, I think. And here, once you have that reconstructive, microvascular reconstructive techniques at hand with you uh, i think it works out very well and once again thanks for your wonderful presentation and i think we will have lot of uh, um, ideas to share from other people who are participating thank you Excuse me, Takashi. Could you stop the screen sharing? Get off the screen sharing at the top of your screen. Just put stop screen share. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Professor Takashi, I think we from Cancer Center would love you to come sometime down to Kerala and do some uh, similar cases in our center, so that we can build our skills and this help a lot of patients in my country. Mm -hmm. Janigaram, sir, your uh, mic is on the mute mode. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Ah, uh, hi, uh, Dr. Takashi. Very good presentation. Congratulations. I just have a few questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, my first question is that uh, the uh, the scan which you showed. The first case which you showed uh, was involving the uh, lamina papyracea. The uh, periorbita was it involved? And uh, if the periorbita is not involved, then would you just go in for a sequential layer resection, or would you still go in for um, the the complete orbital excentration? So that's my first question. You mean you mean the the tumor embedded to the periorbita? If it does not invade the periorbit, then uh, we will aim for uh, orbital excentration. Actually, uh, the this uh, tumor was not malignant, so uh, I I can't identify invaded or not. Just uh, just uh, touch or something. So if uh, we think maybe invaded. Uh, I think it's better to remove with sufficient margin. I mean, uh, orbital excentration because uh, uh, malignant tumor. Yeah, I think there is a position paper, the European position paper on cyanonasal malignancies by Professor um, uh, Lund McKay and uh, Professor Heinz Stamberger, and uh, the uh, position paper says that. Uh, if you do not have an invasion of the periorbita, then you can sequentially resect the periorbita and send that for a frozen. And uh, because because the benefit of doubt of vision, the patient is having a good vision. The extraocular movements are very good. So uh, would it be an overkill to do an orbital excentration for a case where there is no involvement of the periorbita, where you can have frozen section facility? What's your comment? Because that position paper clearly uh, has got four different layers of the orbit where it is involved. But what is the indication for orbital excentration? And uh, the, what is your comment on that? Because 
the patient is having vision, the extra mm -hmm. movements are good. So would you still, you know, give the chance for the patient mm -hmm. to have the vision and the extra movements or would you straight away go ahead and do an orbital exemplation? So if the tumor definitely uh, doesn't invade to the perimeter, I think we don't need to exenterate the orbiter. Uh, but uh, sometimes we cannot un uh, identify that. Uh, Dr. Jari, can I, can I uh, sure. intervene? Yeah. Basically, you are talking about working on close margin in a case of squamous cell carcinoma. I'm not going into the intricate detail. So when you work like closing section control and margin clearance and you go on a piecemeal kind of resection, you compromise on margins for obvious obesity. And these patients, uh, before that, I would like to ask Professor a question. This, this patient would go for postoperative radiotherapy, right? The patient whom this has been operated with uh, craniofacial resection and skull based reconstruction would go for postoperative radiotherapy. Yeah, obviously, I think patient has to go for radiotherapy. The same patient whom you had talked also would go for postoperative radiotherapy. So with that postoperative radiotherapy received on the orbit for the close margin you have attained, patient will obviously, most of the time, will end up with a blind eye because patient will have cataract, may have issues related to uh, circulate because of the postoperative radiotherapy. And at the end of the day, it will not only uh, that survival may drop, but also the morbidity factor also may be more. Maybe Dr. Janaki may be talking about cases with the, uh, the malignancy of the maxillary sinus with doubtful involvement of the intraorbital wall and doubtful involvement of periorbita. Otherwise, cases with the orbital effects involvement or retroorbital malignancy with definite clinical findings of ophthalmoplegia and orbital symptoms definitely would end up in orbital excentration. Other uh, malignancies of the maxillary sinus with uh, maybe the intraorbital wall involvement with doubtful involvement with periorbital, maybe your explanation will be applicable. That's what I think. With frozen section to for periorbital or orbital fire to proceed with orbital excentration. I think I think uh, that is what the position paper or a European position paper states, as Madam says, uh, that that's the uh, consensus, present consensus uh, in the position paper. Well, the second question to Dr. Takashi is that uh, you pre performed a craniofacial resection. Can you hear me, please? Yes. Yeah, uh, you performed a craniofacial resection. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, I mean, for cases of esthesioneuroblastomas going inside, uh, what is your take on endoscopic approach, endoscopic anterior craniofacial resection? Mm, actually, uh, you know, I'm a neurosurgeon, so uh, not the ENT doctor. <laughs> but uh, nowadays, uh, endoscopic surgery is very uh, spread, and I think. Uh, actually, we sometimes we now are using the endoscope, especially for the uh, you know blastoma or uh, even if the angiofibroma or such uh, cases. So, uh, but I think the sufficient margin is uh, important, very important. So if we can. We think we can make the sufficient margin uh, with endoscope, using endoscope. I think we use endoscope. Yeah, I think Professor has answered the question very clearly. When you have a favorable histology, that is a situation where we and we will embark on this kind of procedure when we go purely endoscopic. And otherwise, for, leash, for lesions like the ones which, one which was described here, when the histology is not favorable, you cannot uh, take that kind of chances. Yeah. But the problem in uh, skull-based malignancies is the margin. So the margin, like, you know, the cavernous sinus and uh, the carotid artery or the optic nerves. So mm -hmm. these are problem areas when, when we discuss margins 
but another study, uh, I think even Tata Memorial has got a study of uh, N block, O block resection versus uh, uh, PC resection, and it does not make a significant difference in outcomes. So, what is your take on that, Dr. Tata? Uh, actually, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, there, there are several papers now. There are several papers now which clearly indicate that pre-scheme resection. Mm. Of course, we are not talking about you know uh, unfavorable malignant tumors, but uh, maybe tumors like esthesios or maybe tumors like adenos or adenocarcinomas, adeno uh, adenoid cystic. Uh, there is uh, there are papers you. Uh, you you can make a number of papers to say that uh, piecemeal resection versus O block resection, there is not significant difference in the long term survival rates. So, do you have any take on that? Because you are always interested on the margin. Sometimes you don't get the margin sometimes in the Yeah, Dr. Janikin has made a very valid point. Because basically, what we used to think earlier was, you know, we have to go open for almost all the procedures. But then, now we know the margins are more important than the, uh, the, the, the what we call the sectional resection or piecemeal resection. You can do a piecemeal resection provided you know your margins very well. So that is a concept which is getting more and more accepted, and that too with cases where the histology is also favorable. Otherwise, you have to you have to strictly adhere to the principle of not violating the tumor and all that when you have when you deal with more aggressive histologies but for the general in general you you have to be more focused on your margin and now we realize that even the so-called uh, radical maxillectomy what uh, the total maxillectomy medial maxillectomy and all even when you go open many a times you don't deliver the specimen piece me i mean and block it comes out piecemeal only and even when it uh, when it comes to craniofacial resection many a times that's the case so now we know, rather than being very more dogmatic about the en envelope nature, it's more important to be focusing on to the clearance. So that is where your endoscopy comes into uh, comes for the help. And so there you have a lot of applications where wherein you will embark on an endoscopic approach, even in malignancies. Uh, Dr. John, are you there, Dr. John? Yes, John, I am. Okay, now uh, what is the agenda? You're going to uh, show some live surgery, or can I share one video of the same uh, procedure being done endoscopically? The, let the residents please ask questions first. I think I believe they have some questions, and then maybe after that you can do that. Okay. Okay, Vinod, go ahead. Vinod, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I think. Uh Okay, do any residents have questions or comments? Uh, it's a very interesting lecture. We really enjoyed it. Um, I think this will help us to do a lot of similar cases here. We feel much more refined in our surgical techniques after watching to Professor Takashi's lecture. Yeah. Okay. And I think I would, we'd would love to watch some videos of some glomus jugular fish approach from Dr. Janigram with time permits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, what we can do is the same kind of malignancies which are involving the orbit or involving the uh, cavernous sinus or involving the uh, brain, the frontal lobe, the same thing he has shown the uh, transcranial perspective, we can deal with the endoscopic perspective. So how do you dissect when you do it endoscopically? So I think that will be sort of a meaningful discussion. So then we can discuss what are the merits, demerits of the same procedure? So, uh, if, if you're if you're okay with it, if Dr. John is okay with it and Dr. Vinod is okay with it, I think yeah, I think, I mean, I think I, that's a good idea. Yeah, because it's sort of a different, unrelated uh, stuff. I don't know the agenda of the whole meeting. I thought there's going to be a live research on the procedure. Is it okay if you see uh, endoscopic versus sort of you know uh, external? Yeah, yeah. We'd, we'd love to watch that. Yeah, please go ahead. I think okay, John, so, you okay with your side? I think we'll go so, for that, sir. We'll go for that. Dr. John? Yeah, whatever that Bernard wants to do, go ahead. Okay, Dr. John, uh, they want me to show some 
same similar cases done endoscopically because uh, Dr. Takashi has shown an uh, external approach that is a combined approach and now the same thing done totally endoscopic. Uh, we can have the debate on uh, you know the better uh, the, the pros and cons. Nothing is uh, there's no one way to surgery. Uh, there are different ways to perform a single surgery and uh, we just want to be open about choosing our approach. Is that okay? It's up to Yes. Yes, sir. Can, you, can you share my screen then? Shall I share? Okay, I'm sorry, I, I have to go. I gotta go now. Um, I know. He has his OPD today. I'll sorry. Take it, I'm take sorry. It. Very much. Uh, there's a big, big applause from the here. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you, sir. Thank you the video. Yeah. And Jani Ram sir, I think we like to wind up by nine o'clock, so I think we'll uh, we can have uh, we'll go for the uh, presentation very soon. Yeah. We will not have anything, right? Yeah. So we'll have you we'll have a lecture, but we should wind up by nine o'clock. So we can have a lecture, sir, but we should wind up by nine o'clock because we have cases for the nine o'clock. No, no, yeah. it's just just a three minutes video, just to show. Okay, sure. Just the same thing uh, was done endoscopically. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. Can you can you see my screen? Yes. 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 We can see your screen. Yeah. Hi, this is Dr. Janik Ram Shilpi Bariak Sharma. Can you hear my uh, voice also? We can hear Australia. Okay. I thank Carl Stores for providing the spice camera as to your drill for the surgery done in Malaysia. 40 year old male present with nasal obstruction and this tax and severity today. You can see the MRI scan uh, showing the mask, the uh, nasal cavity going inside the intracranial compartment. This is how the OR1 is done. Uh, the endoscopic anterior perioficial projection was planned. You can see the mask here in the left nasal cavity. You can see the middle turbinate just land into it. It's a brilliant picture by the Spice camera. You can see that uh, the right nasal cavity also had a huge mass there and the patient was bleeding um, from both the uh, nares. We start the uh, surgery with the lateralization of the inferior turbinate, medialization of the middle turbinate. We do an anterior posterior thoracotomy and a draft 3. You're seeing now that the draft 3 has been already done. You can see that uh, very clearly, the draft tree has been done. We use a navigation uh, by the brain lab. Uh, they supply the navigation. We have seen the site for the osteotomy. And uh, once we design the site for the osteotomy, then we will be uh, dealing with the tumor. You can see the tumor is going intracranially. That's the crystalline being dissected. You can see that very clearly the crystalline is uh, being dissected from both sides. You can see that it has been eroded actually by the tumor. And uh, you can, in fact, see how beautifully uh, with a 7 telescope, Shilpi Bade Sharma has given me a fantastic view and I'm able to see every bit of what is being done. And uh, this is uh, the dissection of the Krista Galli. And once we dissect it out, then we will be going for uh, the intracranial portion of the tumor. <laughs> You can see that all the movements are extremely gentle. There is no cooling. That nephrotomy, even part of the tumor. That is the principle of microdissection. Now, the advantage of an endoscopic anterior official dissection is that anterior model artery, which supplies the tumor, as you can see on the right side, is being cauterized. So the blood supply of the tumor is uh, tackled first. You can see the uh, assault bipolar. Cautery being used there, and we are cauterizing the anterior model artery. This will be done on both sides. The posterior model artery also will be cauterized on both sides. And once we do that, that's on the uh, left side. You can see the lamina papyracea to the right of your picture. We are now cauterizing the anterior model artery. And then we will start doing the osteotomy with a diamond bar. We take a uh, three millimeter. Uh, in fact, uh, I love it because of its tactile. Automatically irrigates. Now, once we do that, we have now op we're opening up the dura, and you can see that we will be sending each part of it for uh, uh, biopsy, a frozen section. That is the tumor which is seen going intracranially. We can see the dura very clearly, and now we are 
cutting off the uh, midline forks there and uh, we're using the Kassam scissors to do that. Once we do that, you can see the whole tumor, the brain pulsations there very, very beautifully. You can also see that uh, anteriorly, the uh, tumor, the, that's the area free of tumor. So we are now taking a biopsy of the tumor now and the providing forceps, no pulling again, just by the providing forceps. Now we use the four hand technique uh, as described by the Pittsburgh group. Uh, and uh, you can see that every bit of the uh, vessels are seen and dissected away very, very gently, not to traumatize any of the vessels, maybe the intratumoral vessels, yes, but then tumors on the surface. This is basically an extra arachnoid dissection. You can see that we are identifying the arachnoid plane and going around the tumor very, very slowly and gently. In fact, this uh, surgery took around uh, two and a half, three hours, but then only the dissection part was uh, the main part of the uh, tumor of uh, the, the timing. So you can see that uh, scissors is used to dissect and you can see that the vessels are identified that's again the uh, there leaving behind that vessels there and now we're using the cautery to the intratumoral vessels and finally we have completely resected the whole tumor in total in one single piece it is uh, a very beautiful technique um, See, there was a little bit of pyrimination there by the tumor, and now we wash that area very well with ringolactate solution. And once we do that, now we will be anyway, we will be planning for reconstruction. We did a halad um, on both sides actually. Now uh, we have fat along that edges so that we will not have a CSF leak. We kept surgery cell over the surface of the brain, and you can see the halad flap all around and that will form a very good seed. Now this is a material called the DuraSoft and that, is, that that will be placed as an inlay graft. So that is actually placed as an inlay graft, the DuraSoft. It's a very, very brilliant material for uh, uh, replacing the in Duragen being used as an inlay grafting. So you can now see how beautifully the Duragen is uh, covering the whole defect there. And that is uh, very, very nicely placed. And then the next stage will be uh, on lay craft. And you can see that we're bulldozing that uh, the uh, duragen. And you can see that uh, this actually that will be done. No sinuses should be closed to the uh, duragen. And once we do that, on the uh, left side has come up that's some actually sinus and that's the sphenoid sinus in the midline you can see that and now we are going to start putting the right side hadar now you can see the sphenoid has been left behind the frontal on the right is left behind but then the left will definitely be humanized thank you completely free and So that, that's just uh, one case. We are uh, presenting a... Uh, can you hear me, Dr. John? I can hear you, sir, but what's the histology like? Yeah, this is actually a ethysi neuroplastoma. And we have a of, uh, 16 cases uh, done uh, endoscopically. So we have, we have sent it for my publication. So what we do is we downgrade the tumor with uh, chemotherapy, induction chemotherapy. And then, uh, uh, and then we go in for endoscopic antiochemofacial resection. So, yeah, now we can have comments. Uh, Dr. Janki, for in this specific case, what was the pre-op radiological evaluation finding for this case? Oh, I showed you that. Uh, the MRI showed, I showed you the MRI, which uh, showed the uh, tumor inside of the cranial cavity going inside the dura. You want to see that again? Yes. You want to see that again? Yes, yes. Hi, this is a stop. This is a specific intracranial extension. 
You can see that? Hello? Yeah, suppose, suppose if this, uh, in this case, if the tumor was just affecting the libriform plate and the margin was positive during frozen section, how will you proceed? Oh, can, I can't hear your question, please. Yeah, if, if suppose in this case, if it was not a, an intracranial extension and the tumor was just affecting the cribriform plate or up to the ah. plate, how will you proceed? Okay, what we do is uh, we perform, even yesterday we did a case, similar case. Uh, we perform what is called the, uh, according to the uh, Pittsburgh classification, we perform the sequential layer resection. So we go one step above. So if the bone is abetting the bone, we take off the bone till the dura. If the dura is involved, we resect the dura till the level of the arachnoid. So if the, uh, usually the arachnoid layer is preserved. So we go, uh, if the, there is pile invasion, then, you know, the, the, uh, the prognosis becomes poor. But whatever we do in a case of a malignancy, we go one step above uh, uh, the uh, particular area involved. So this is uh, basically also in the orbit. This is what the position paper also states. So what we do is one, one layer above. It's called the sequential layer resection. So if the bone is involved, the cribriform plate is involved, we take off the cribriform plate, cut off the optic, uh, the, uh, the olfactory and send it for frozen and uh, that's it. We go till the dura. Now, Dr. Janaki Raman, this is, uh, you are talking about an aesthetic neuroblastoma. So the same picture, if you had it with a squamous cell carcinoma, but involving the uh, anterior base, uh, skull base and that it's roof, um, I mean, uh, uh, if it goes at the paper form, uh, the same kind of picture with squamous cell carcinoma, what would be, would, would be your approach? Uh, my approach would be the same. My approach would be the same because I'm, I'm not going to have, uh, uh, I'm going to go one step above, I'm going to resect the dura or maybe, see, uh, uh, once there is uh, invasion of the arachnoid, whether you do it craniofacial from above or below or whatever, it's not going to make a big difference in your survival rates once it's uh, invaded the arachnoid. So if it's invaded the dura, you resect the dura completely. So uh, you have to go one step above and resect it. So it's immaterial whether you go from above or below. But the uh, principle... Can you imagine that of uh, a station neuroblastoma, the same frozen section Pittsburgh approach you will you'll employ for uh, squamous cell carcinoma also? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, for so this, is the first, this one layer uh, clearance? One layer above. You have to go one layer above. We, we do it for adenocarcinomas, adenoid cystic carcinomas. We have an issue because you cannot afford to maintain that kind of margins for squamous cell carcinoma. So, okay, if, if uh, in squamous cell carcinoma you have an invasion of the bone, then how much more would you resect? Janigaram, sir. Uh, what actually was the technician told us? If the dura is involved, it is contraindicated for the it's a contraindicated for surgery. But according to you, if the dura is involved, you can still go so for the resection. Is that what Absolute, you can Absolutely. That, see, uh, before the endoscopic era, now if you see a lot of papers, now if you see a lot of papers, cavernous sinus invasion was a relative contraindication for surgery. Cavernous sinus invasion, cavernous sinus invasion was a relative contraindication for surgery. But now we operate in the cavernous sinus. No. So relative contraindications have become now sort of, of course, you, we know that there is a little morbidity involved by cutting off the cranial nerves. But then we, we operate. We operate for, for such cases. I think, I think uh, if we go on to the uh, European position paper by, uh, there are, I think, 10 people involved, Castelnovo, uh, then Perry Nicolai, and then uh, Heinz Stamberger, uh, Valery Lund. I was a part of the panel in the European Congress. So they have clearly put down on what to do for cyanasal uh, I think that was not for the stomacal custom. It was for the station or was and uh, low grade to. But yes, no, think about no. stomacal custom with during movement. For, for squamous cell carcinomas, for squamous cell carcinomas involving just the limited nasal cavity, just the ethmoids. With, just dura, the ethmoids. with the dura, with dura. Okay, 
Okay, I understand. I understand your question very clearly. If if it is with the dura, then what is uh, you want to do a craniofacial resection, right? Is that your take? You don't want to operate. Huh? The, the dura is involved. Be here, don't operate. If just okay. the bone is involved, we'll go for the resection. But dura is not the contraindicated for surgery. Dura is contraindicated for surgery. Yeah. Okay, fine. So I take that point. Thank you, sir. It's an interesting lecture. We really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, it's just a Thank discussion. You. Thank you. Uh, John. Dr. John. Dr. John. Dr. John Bennett. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. John, for your time. You really helped us to do this in a great manner. Thanks a lot. Well, we look forward to doing more. <laughs> okay, good night, everybody. I'll go off camera. Thank you very much, all. And I guess I have to split the speaker's fee with Naran. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, we'll stop broadcasting right now. Thank you. Thank you.